Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Anthony P. Consciousness Hour. This particular show is going to be a very interesting one because, you know, over the years, I've been wanting to move a lot of the conversations into my great other area of interest, which is music. And I just love music. And we've had a series of um, semi-famous musicians um, on the show over the last few years. And today's guest is no exception. The exceptionally talented singer-songwriter uh, Dean Johnson, who's a fellow Aurelian to myself. And one of the things that uh, the world seems to be very much on the theme at the moment, because um, last weekend I did an event at the University of Bath. And while I was there, I got chatting to a guy called Steve Parsons. Now, I've known Steve for many, many years. He went to the same school as I did. He went to World Grammar School and he was around about five or six years younger than me. And he's a well-known writer in esoteric circles. And we just got chatting before one of the events. And we were he was talking about particularly, and Dean, you might find this interesting. He was talking about um, a, a field outside of, um, between uh, Eastern Village and Ellesmere Port. And he said he'd known this field for many years and it, it had been never been used for farmland and nothing really grew on it at all. And he did some research and he discovered that apparently ordnance from the Second World War had been buried there, um, poison gas and various other things had been buried in this field and hadn't been used because the Germans clearly didn't invade. Now, we were both discussing it. And he said and it's it was on a road running um, from uh, Eastham to Ellesmere Port. And we couldn't remember the name of the road. So anyway, I literally left him and I went into the, the lecture theatre and I just checked my phone messages. And I got a message, literally, the, the, when I was talking to this, to when I was talking to um, Steve only a few seconds before, this message had come through almost exactly the same moment. And it was a guy from a guy called Rob Gandhi. Now, Rob Gandhi is, um, is Dr. Rob Gandhi, and he writes for 14 times. And he's a well-known writer and well-known contributor to 14 times. And he always sends me bits of messages about things he's discovering. Uh, and he'd sent this message and he said he'd discovered a whole series of new time slips that had taken place at the bottom of Bowl Street in Liverpool. And I'm really interested in this. And then I read <laughs> down and he turns around and he says, and he, for no apparent reason, he mentions Riverca Road. And he said, and the road that runs from Eastham to Ellesmere Port. And I'm going, that's the name of the road that Steve Parsons and I were trying to remember three or four minutes ago. <laughs> so I went back down to Steve and I said, you wouldn't believe the synchronicity of this. And of course, one of the themes I was talking about was synchronicities. So, you know, you had this kind of Wirral link, yeah. Freedway Wirral link, and then suddenly that as well. And of course, you're a, a, a Wirral singer songwriter as well. So without further ado, Dean, how can you tell us firstly how you came across my work? How did we become in contact? The um, well, I think you know, I think it was. Uh, I mean, I'd seen you on, I'd seen you on, on Facebook. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd seen um, postings, your postings, and postings about you on there, and and what time, and when also when so some of some of my um i do i do these things called musical uh, musical biographies and um and what's it and one of them have been about sylvia plath and and so i'd um i, I often perform these things in in um in, in bookshops up and down the country and, on, and and like kind of fringe literature festivals and the what time and I've I've often I've often been to uh, go to places where you've been where you've been before me or I saw a poster of you come in come in next and things like that and um and what and we'd um and, and when you you know when you're involved in a project um because I I try I I remember trying I did get in touch with you and and tried to in, involve you in um it might have been it might have been um, my Wilfred Owen one, or I don't, I don't know whether it, it may have been a George Mallory one because he was a bit he was a bit more mystical and stuff. Mm. And um, but we were both really busy and um, and what's in and Facebook and things like that. It 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 it, it churns up so fast, doesn't it? You're yeah. dealing with stuff, and then the days go on, and and then you know, and your message gets further down, and we and we can't we couldn't get it together. Yeah, 
Well, we um, must, we must, we must do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Mallory particularly, very, very interesting. You know, I presume you mean Mallory, the uh, the mountaineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, who, who lived in Oxton, you know, and 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 his and his his little sidekick, um, Sandy Irvine. You know, you know, he, he lived just around the perimeter of Birkenhead Park, mm. and um, yeah, but there, but there was sort of there were there were there were quite a lot of of. Um, mystical things and the um in a lot of a lot of psychological angles to, to their attempt at Everest because they were um Mallory was a was was a big friend of of Alistair Crowley right. and and there, there was sort of you know they, they were there were there were members there were members of this snow like the Snowdonia climbing club you know that that's that's where they met and um really and what so it, get this so I get this right so Mallory met Crowley at the Snowdown Climbing Club. Yeah. Wow. And what's him? And they they they, st they still meet in the in the original little hut thing where where Crowley where C Crowley and and Mallory met. And um, I've you know, been they're... there. I've been there because yeah. many years ago I went went. I know I was with a group of climbers and it was the Guida Mountain Club and they had this little hut at the back in near Cricketh, I think it was. Maybe it was yeah, the same. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And um, and because before Mallory, before Mallory and Irvin had their attempt and, and where they disappeared, um, Mallory Mallory had got had got um three quarters of the way up there before with 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 Crowley, you know, about about four years before. And um, so what it was, it was his second attempt after that, but he was but. But Mallory had been an advisor and everything uh, on on uh, Crowley's expedition, but um, and and a lot of it, you know, that 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 one they did with Crowley, you know, the day they left and everything like that, it was all based on, a, on a, uh, astrological things. You know, they, they were it was all based on astrological numbers of when they went and you know when they moved to the next base camp. It was all it was all based on um, you know, runes and stuff. Wow. And um, and what and when it it only it only failed because um, what it wasn't they weren't getting up the mountain fast enough for Crowley, and um, and also the, the Sherpas were complaining because they they were they were they were carrying um, uh, Crowley's whole collection of of occult magic books <laughs> up the up the up the mountain with them, and then. Um, then what time? Then uh, he said, "I want to, you know, I want to get to the summit quicker than we're going. You know, you've got to, you've got to find a route for me, Mallory, uh, for us to get there quicker." And uh, Mallory said, "Look, you've got the, the only thing that dictates our speed is the weather. You know, the weather is either good or it's not. I can't do anything about that." And then Crowley, Crowley pulled a gun on him, and uh, and then Mallory was out of there. <laughs> wow, good lord! Yeah, they, and what type of things like Crowley? They, you know, they did it. They they ascended the mountain uh, what's it naked as well you know Crowley Crowley insisted that they were naked as they did it you know in forty you know well well it's it's forty below overnight on, on Everest it's really hot in the day in the in the day it's you know it's in the hundreds and at the night it's it's minus forty and um, but it's what's it, it's amazing stories about Mallory and and Crowley Crowley's mountain adventures you know. Well, funnily enough, I'm again. It's coincidental. Actually, next week I'm I'm up in Scotland and I, I'm planning to go to um, Bolskin Manor, the location of Bolskin yeah, yeah. on, on Loch Ness. You know, um, that's what it, it, it was owned once. I don't know whether it still is. It was, it was owned Page. by Jimmy Page, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. But I I I deb I debuted um, the me Mallory uh, musical uh, musical biography. Uh, it's called it's it's called Ice Picks and Violets. It was called Ice Picks and Violets, and um, I, I debuted it at, at Treadwells in Bloomsbury. Mm -hmm, I know it in that you know Treadwells, the occult bookshop, and what him and apparently apparently that was once owned by Jimmy Page. That really? that shop was once owned, and uh, and what him he had what him Page had he had the very very first. Printed copy of of uh, of what's in one of Crowley's books was it Ma Magic Without Tears or something? Extraordinary. Uh, 
Yeah. Wow, this is going to be a fascinating conversation. We haven't <laughs> even started and we're already on to Crowley and some fascinating esoteric stuff because I've always been interested in the, the link between Jimmy Page and Crowley, you know, and the, the whole Bolskin Manor story and everything else as well. And Jimmy Page's interest in the occult, you know, so maybe that's something we'll yeah. touch upon. But let's talk about you. Let's talk about your early days. How did you get, how did your musical career start then? The, um, well, you know, in back in back in the early in the early seventies, um, the what's if you if you were writing your own songs and that you know and you didn't have a band, um, there was a re there was a really healthy folk scene in the Wirral and you know and surrounding area Liverpool you know because you in in those days you know yeah you, you, you had a folk club being run by the Spinners and and things like that and um, and what's in and there, you know there must have been about twenty folk clubs in the Wirral and um, I, I was trying to be uh, I was trying to be a songwriter I only I only became a performer because I wrote I wrote songs and I, and I wanted to sing them you know and um I wanted to sing them just by a way because I wanted to sing songs and I was writing them all the time and the you know that may may be the same in, in your career the, the, there always seemed to be people that encouraged me at the right time. Somebody would say something to me, and, and that would give me the encouragement to, ca to carry on to the next step. And then, so at the at the Parkgate uh, Folk Club, you know, the, the the second gig I did w was opening for a, a, a touring act called called the Humble Bums, which which was uh, which was a bit of Billy Connolly and and Jerry Rafferty, mm -hmm. and um, and what's name, you know, but. Uh, you know, at, at the time, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, they, I, I knew, I, you know, I, I'd known the, 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 um, the what's name, uh, Jerry's, Jerry's band one, you know, what's name, Stuck in the Middle. Steve oh, Steve's Wheel. wheel. And, Steve's um, Wheel, yeah. 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 And, um, and what's name, but, so I, I did, I did, I, I did a little 20 minute spot opening for them and I did four of my own songs and Blowing in the Wind. And, um, and you know, and this, this, just this, this what's name hillbilly gypsy type Glaswegian guy, you know, came up to me who, who I didn't know at the time, you know, was, was Billy Connolly, and, and just said, "Hey kid, you know, did, did you write, did you write those songs you performed?" And I said, "Yeah," and he said, "Well, you really can write," and he said, "Carry on because you're good," and then you know, so the what's name, and then and then you know the, they split up, and and Jerry Rafferty became what he became, and Billy became what he became, you know, and and I kind of had an endorsement from him, you know, and I thought. You know, because I was only I was only thirteen, something wow. like that, and uh, and what's him? I thought, well, I must be I must be doing something right, and so uh, um, so I kind of I, I kind of persevered on the folk scene, and because I was kind of a bit of a, a bit of a novelty because I was so young and I was writing my own stuff, and um, and you know I think you know I think the songs were were pretty good, and um, the um. So anyway, I, I used to cause quite a stare because you know some little kid used to go on the stage and that, and um, and I, and then I, I was given, you know, I was given the support, you know, for for everyone, you know, any any you know a lot of a lot of American tour musicians and that they they always gave the, the support to me, and um, you know, and then a, co a couple of these a couple of these American tour acts, you know, a couple of them started doing my songs and they would do them in folk clubs back in back in New York and stuff, and. Um, so the what's name? So that, anyway, yeah, that that was it, 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 the beginnings were you know in like in in like tra traditional folk clubs, and the the good thing about that, Anthony, was that you know in in, the, in those days you would get you get a hundred people in these back room of a pub, and um you know and you, and you would stand there and people were like three for me, you know and the and what's name and I'm standing there shaking with the guitar. But but you got you got to find out you found out whether a song could hold people's attention or you found out whether the song had any worth or not because you could just see them yawning or starting to talk among each other but they but but they didn't and it, and it was just a, it was just a great it was great training ground a great you know and a great place to to learn like the the, the art of a, of a story song because they folk clubs are steeped in in songs full of myths and tradition and things like that so. Um, I, I knew I knew that you didn't get anywhere by writing songs like you know I I, I met a girl you know I love you baby you love me yeah 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 the what same things had to have a beginning the middle and end of the story so what same so it kind of it kind of upped the ante on the, the content of my songs 
and um, you know, things like that, and what's even and because they were a listening audience because they were so quiet. Yeah, you, you know, you had to get things right. You know, you had to you had to play play the guitar in such a way that the arrangement held up. You know, and it was um, and it was what same it was uh, it was great, just a great great place to start. You know, it's very interesting that you saying that. I mean, I've always loved singer songwriters. <laughs> Um, and I always focus in on the lyrics and the lyrics are profoundly important for me. Um, and, you know, I'm reminded, you know, of the, the great, the great, the great singer songwriters, the great UK singer songwriters, such as, for argument's sake, Al Stewart, maybe, you know, somebody yeah. who weaves incredible stories. And of course, then you have Jackson Brown over in America, you know, again, a very erudite writer that you listen to the, yeah. songs, the songs are emotionally powerful. And I've always wondered how difficult that must be when you're just you and a guitar holding the audience and how you can hold the audience spellbound with songs they've never heard before. And you, as you say, you must be a storyteller to draw them in yeah, yeah. and be interested. Yeah. The, what time, the, the, um, and it, it must be like yourself when you, when you do your lectures. Now, I think that um, if, if you, you know, yeah, if the story has, if the story has got some emotional resonance to you um and what's in if you if you if you're honest if you if you if you perform honestly um and what's saying then then uh, you know that the then the, the, the audience will believe you you know if you if you if you if you, tell, if, you if you tell the truth um you know and 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 put it and be as articulate as you can then then they will get into it you know i mean you know like jackson brown um and and al stewart um Jackson Jackson is almost he's almost an author isn't he he's a writer he's um his song his songs you know you know they they're so complete um, but they're, they're almost they're almost like they could be a, a, a one act play couldn't they you know the the characters are so well drawn and the sit and the situations and um you know I mean the, for instance one of his the, songs the, I think is great it's like one of his songs I think is brilliant in the shape of a heart and he sings yeah. and was well, something that was thrown that that just missed and it hit the wall and it was the shape of a fist and it is yeah. just the imagery of of conflict between a couple and you know I think one of his most powerful songs I think that always moves me is for a dancer yeah. Yeah, oh, that is just such a powerful song about death. I don't know what happens when people die. Can't seem to grasp it as hard as I try. It's like a song somebody's playing right in your ear and you can't help listening. And I don't remember losing track of you. You were always dancing in and out of you. Just genius in in short sharp words. And from listening to your music, you have that same ability with a beautiful humor which you know it's your humor yeah. that makes yeah, it yeah. magical. But so how did you get, you know, so it's the early days, but what was your big break? What was the the opportunity that you grasped at? You know, um, yeah, what what, what time? Um, you know, just before that, you know that, you know that what just I've got because you're so into him, you know, Jackson Brown's um the what time these days. Oh you know, what, god, that's what, a great it, song. What, it, that was the that was the first song he ever wrote. He was he was 17. Yeah. And, he, and in that song, he says, "What time? Don't, don't remind me of my failures. I haven't forgotten them." Yeah, she was seventeen. Yeah, he was, seven, he was seventeen, and he goes, "Don't remind me of my failures." You know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is. It's shivers. Yeah. So the um. So anyway, the you know, so that that you know, the folk years and that that's like you know, you know, it's it's all like you know, 70, 72 and seventy three and everything, and. The I kind of uh, I kind of outgrew it, you know. I, I sort of um, you know I became like I was quite popular around here on, on the folk circuit and everything, and I was kind of everybody's um, I, I was everybody's darling in a way. And um, and the thing as far as the folk clubs went, you know, sometimes when you've achieved a certain level and all that, and uh, people in people invest a lot of of their hopes in you, you know, there was a, there's a lot of singer songwriters on the folk circuit and they, they were older and they saw themselves in me. And, and, and sometimes the, the, the pats on the, the pats on the back are killing you, you know, they were saying, you know, the people are encouraging you, but sometimes it gets too heavy. You can't grow because you, you're always being patted on the back. And um, so then, um, 
you know, so then, then, you know, then I, you know, I formed a, you know, a rock band, I formed an electric band, you know, and, and started, um, and started working within, you know, the folk, you know, I mean, folk rock, I suppose, um, you know, started working within, within the, the, the rock spectrum. And that was, a, you know, that, that's tougher in a way, because there's so many, you know, the, the what same song, it, it's, it's, it's about impact and, and the way you look and everything, it's not so song centered. And um and so um I formed I formed a band called Language and then and then you know steadily we we became you know big in you know, big in the Wirral and we were filling every, everywhere and and what's and when then we I, I was sending I was I was sending off demo tapes to London and everything and then like then Virgin Records uh, became interested. And they put they put us on they put us on a tour with uh, with Doctor and the Medics, a university tour, and um and even even at that level, even at a level where we had, you know, we we'd just been playing around here and we were all mates and everything, but then as soon as soon as we got a dressing room, and um you know and a couple of free bottles of beer and a and a what's name and a couple of sandwiches, well the, the dynamic within the band it, it it began to change, you know, people's egos. You know, grow and because you know, then you know there were a couple of girls at the dressing room door or something like that, and um, and what's name and Virgin were really interested in signing us, but they were to, but the but the the signs of us the signs of us breaking up were already there. If they if they were going to give us any money and everything, we would we would just we would just fall apart, and um, and what's name because I I was writing everything and singing everything, and because we were young then you know that kind of imploded you know and what's in record companies can they can sense this stuff a mile off you know the look and um so the what's in so there was um there was just more of that you know you know form forming bands and and stuff and um and then i want to say i became in in 1991 I said, I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to do this on my own. Um, what's that? I opened for, um, I opened a show for Richard Thompson. And, um, the in great Brighton. Richard Thompson. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, what's that? and then after the, after, after, the, well, just before his encore, he, um, he said, I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask, I've never done this before, but I'm going to ask my support act to come back up and join me because because he, he said I think Dean's fan I've never met him before but I think he's fantastic and then I did we did roll over Beethoven together you know and then um so and then I was just like it, it, it the the what's saying it, it it just put me on cloud nine that that the Thompson had acknowledged me and um and well gave, his reputation know, his, is huge isn't it yeah. and his reputation yeah. as being a very difficult individual also so for him to say that of you is an extraordinary accolade. yeah yeah it was i'm not saying and he you know the um he was yeah he was such an extraordinary person and he and he was very i i he, after that I, he invited me to a couple of other gigs and i and i kind of and i kind of traveled with him and um and because um because he'd become a sufi yeah i was going to ask there, you about that yeah um you know, then the, the, what's in the, there were certain times of the day when you when you you had to pull off the road and he had he had to pray. You know, and we were playing we were playing really small places. You know, like folk clubs in the back of pubs and things like that. And it you know you know you get you you get a rider when you're a star. You know, a thing called a rider, which is which is what what you want to eat and drink and any other any other requirements you have. And he he wanted a he want he wanted a mat. He, he asked for a mat. To kneel on, and um, and I think an, an, an empty room facing uh, you'd know more than me. I don't know was it first, fa facing east, or facing Mecca. It has to face yeah. Mecca. Yeah, yeah. And um, but anyway, we, we rolled up at places, Anthony, and uh, and they said, "Oh, we got your rider and all that. I'm just looking for something for a mat for you." And in a couple of places, they just gave him the wet beer mat, the, the wet beer cloth off the bar. <laughs> there, there was dripping with last night's cider. The thing is, he he just he just wrung it out, and then he kneeled on it, you know, and he he didn't complain. He just he just got on with it, you know, and um, and so that when it, like working with Thompson, like those few those couple of gigs with Thompson, 
that um, that real that really jettisoned my sort of my self belief, and uh, and I thought I, I'm de I definitely must have something, you know, and um, and so. I, uh, it was a continuous because I was always writing all the time and I, and I was recording, um, you know, catching studio time off friends and things. And um, I just like bombarding, you know, publishing companies and rec companies with, with my stuff. And there was a there was a, a, la a label called Demon Records. And, a, and it's it's quite pertinent because it, it was co-owned by Elvis Costello. So, you know, with him, you know, with him being because because he, he grew up in Birkenhead. Because um, you know that, don't you? You know that yeah. Costello grew up in the North End. Yeah, uh, McManus. Uh, Declan yeah. McManus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in what's in Gorby Road. Gorby Road. Because his dad, his dad was the guy that did the secret lemonade drinker yeah. thing, didn't it? Yeah. Him, his, his dad had residencies all around the world with his jazz band. And, um, but... But anyway, the, the, what I um, I sent I sent a demo to, to Demon Records, and I thought I thought it I thought it might get open because it's simply because it had a Birkenhead postcode, you know, and, and their general, you know, general manager or something was from Birkenhead, and um, and so anyway, but it, I sent it off and kind of forgot about it, and then meanwhile the the, the tape the the guy the guy at Demon the A and R man he, he gets the tape. And, and puts it in his car, and and starts listening to it in, in his in his car in his BMW or something. And then, meanwhile, across across London, you know, Chris Difford from Squeeze, the his 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 what's name his his brother is is an accountant for for Demon Records, and Chris Chris Difford's car needs to go into the garage, so um so he asks around, can he can he borrow a car? And then his brother says to him, "Oh, there's a couple of cars at Demon, and you can borrow one of them." And the, and they lent him a like a staff car from Demon Records, and he jumps in that, and you know, and he's going, you know, going across town. And my my cassette, my cassette is in the player, and then um, and he re he really really likes it. He, he gets it out of the cassette player, and it, it's just got Dean Johnson. I put my phone number on it, and then um, and then I'm, I'm just I'm just eating, I'm just my mum's just making me tea. Uh, like that later that night, and the phone goes, and it's and it's Chris Difford, and um, and what's name, and and he said, I've got your I've got your tape. I borrowed a car and put the tape in, and I really really like it. And I, I want you to, I want you to come down to Rye uh, to my house and play me what other songs you've got. And um, so he said, I'll get Demon to send you some money. And they said, Well, well that'll be great. And I said, So he said, Come come down tomorrow. And um, so I, you know, I, I had a residency at Stanley's Cask and things like that. You know, I had all these residencies and everything. I had to phone them and said I can't come tomorrow because I've got to go down to East Sussex and uh, and meet Chris Difford. And um, and I, what's, as I, as I got there, the, what's saying the um, yeah, they sent me the train fare and everything. The next day I was on a train down there and I got a taxi from Rye from Rye Station over over to Difford's house. And um. As I was leaving, uh, as I got there, Brian Ferry was leaving the house. Brian Brian Ferry was leave, leaving Chris Difford's because Difford was managing him at the time. And um, and so then, so I'm sitting there. Then I'm, I'm sitting there having fish fingers, chips and fish fingers with Chris Difford. And um, and then he just said, you know, I've told you about a deal with with Dean and and um, and what's going on? I'm gonna I'm gonna produce your album. And um, and then. The um and then the, what's in so he said oh, I'm gonna um what's in uh, Costello has heard it and he likes it so you so your band on the album are gonna be the attractions so the, what's in, so he said they're they're coming they're coming down on Monday so um so there there you know, there it was then you know you know he just he just said you know phone you know phone your wife or whatever or your mom and then say that you you're, you're going to be down here for a month or so doing this. And um, and, and I, so I, rec I recorded this album with the attractions, and then the what time? And then it was, it, you know, it was great. It sounded great and all that. And then um, it, a release date was set, and um, and then then Demon went bust, and um, so it so it never so it never came out, and uh, and that that was the that was the beginning of a, of a, lo a load of different setbacks, which is 
you know, which I'm famous for. I'm, fa I'm famous for achieving these things and famous for them. I was going wrong, but that was the, that was the very first one. <laughs> Is is that album still available? Did you did you still have the master tapes? Yeah, I've got I've got I've got you know yeah I've got I've got a rough I've got a rough mix of it yeah I've got a rough mix of it on a on a CDR yeah wow but but but, but from that I, I picked up you know I picked up another another record another record deal from that from uh, I kind of I kind of used the rough mix of that album as a demo to get another album deal. And everything, and um, so it, it was useful. It was really frustrating and heartbreaking at the time, but then it just led to other things because because Difford was involved, and then um, and then of course he he took me on, you know, he he invited he invited me on the on the national tour with them, you know that was my, that was my first tour, you know, what's saying thirty nine dates with Squeeze, and um and every and everything that everything that span off from that. I, I re recorded the album again and um. And what's name and uh, the wet 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 with a backing band on the next version of it, and um, you know and that what's name and that we and of course you know there was things like the you know I had all, all sorts of television and lined up and everything and uh, and the single ready to go and um, but then of course then of course um, uh, Marty Pello OD'd, yeah. you know what's and, uh, and of course that, that and then and then that that kind of sent that, that kind of scuppered a few plans that we had for that but you know that's that's what's saying that's the rock business you know mm. and one of the things you said on facebook i thought was very funny when you turned around and said yeah marty pello laughs all the time and he smiled that smile is, a, is 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 permanently on him and i thought that was a really wonderful kind of picture of certain individuals you know and and how yeah. the nuance of that um but but really, you haven't had a great deal of luck there with that, have you? You know, it always seems that no. you're almost there. Yeah, the, the what's saying the um, yeah, um, I, have, I, I you know I did get I did I got dogged by quite a lot of bad luck, but mm. it was it was the sort of thing. But I, I had good luck to be you know I got a lot of good luck to be able to have the bad luck and, yeah. and everything. You know, I, I was you know I was get, I was getting to places. I mean I, mean, I, I was. I was I was failing at a lot higher level than um than than if it's still if I, if, I, if I was still at Stanley's Cask or whatever or still at the Parkgate Hotel, you know the, when the, the you know Anthony as you as you as you climb ladders like that the the, the, the stakes get higher you know the, what's saying the, the the rewards are a lot more there's a there's a, there's a lot more of a buzz and everything but the um the the what's saying the downs and things like that are bigger but, but that's you know that's that's what you get. That's the price of, of dreaming bigger. You know, mm. and um, and what time? And you know, it, it's sort of it's not. Um, show, you know, the rock business. Well, show business itself. It's not. It it's not. It's not called a friend business. It's show business in it. You know, yeah. it's what's in it. It's it's very. It's very. It's very cutthroat. You know, and um, they would say, and everyone, every a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of for everyone that, that gave me a hand up. You know, a, a lot of people were trying to keep you down or whatever, you know, and um, and stuff. Well, if they, um, see, if they see talent and if it's because the talent is you, you know, as a singer songwriter, they're going to see that. I mean, there's been a number of other people on this show in the background in the past, people like Steve Balsamo and, and individuals that are incredibly talented like yourself. And they're so talented, they can put their hand to anything. So, you know, like yeah. Rob, like yourself, he's very interested in country rock, in folk rock. And because my, my musical taste is incredibly wide and very, very deep, I know a lot of obscure, comparatively obscure musicians whose work is simply brilliant. And you think that only one big break, just one break would break that person huge. Yeah. And it must be so frustrating when you hone a song and it's brilliant and you're so pleased with it, but nobody really ever hears it. And that must be heartbreaking because yeah. it's part of you, isn't it? You know? Yeah. 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 The, the, what's saying, the, um, back, you know, back before the Difford interlude, um, you know, when I, when I was doing my rock band language, the one that Virgin were interested in, um, when they didn't sign us, they, they put one of my songs forward um, to the the Charles Moye her solo her first solo album mm. and and what's her name and she she recorded it and 
and she needed I think she needed 12 songs for um 12 songs for the album and mine was so, so just to get that right so one of your songs was the album Alf was that yeah. the album Alf yeah and yeah. one of your songs is on that no there was oh. a, she she recorded it she recorded she, she recorded it for it and um the one thing she recorded 15 songs which one of them was mine but then then she had to then she had to do it then she had a short list of 11 oh. and I, I didn't make the final 11 and um and what's saying you know thing that was back in you know that was back in 86 or something you know it was like you know close but no cigar but you know mm. that, that's the way that's the way it was because again um, to hear probably to hear somebody like Alison Moyer who's got a very distinctive voice yeah performing your song I mean again do did you do you have you got a copy of her performing that song anywhere yeah I have yeah I've got you know I've got I've got her demo of it yeah wow but I, I, I can set with her demo of it you know and um you know those you know those things those things that don't happen you know I think that you know and I would say the some you know somebody somebody that was managing me once you know that you know that um you know if she'd done that and it had been a hit you know, the song was called heart to heart and um if you know in the 80s if when when if language had been signed and we'd had one or two, or two hits then you you kind of back those two songs and then when i when i got a lot of recording deals in the 90s and I, and I caused a lot of I got a lot of critical acclaim um well I wouldn't I wouldn't have got that if I'd, if I'd had a hit in the 80s yeah because the the, the public the public and the public and the rock critics they will only let you have one hit and one, once you do then you're stuck like a, a butterfly like a butterfly on a on a dartboard you're stuck there and that's where that's where they want you but like a girl that was managing me once, she always said that every time I make a record, I'm, I'm fresh out the box because you you can't you can't trace me back to some dodgy hit with synths on it in the eighties, you know. You you have you have no way, laughing you have no laughing gnome in yeah. your background. It didn't seem to bother Bowie terribly, but I, I see that. So how do no. things move on from there yeah. then? So you have this slight run of bad luck, but then things really seem to to really start to happen for you, as I understand it. The, 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 it, it was just it, what it, um, the it, it, it was it was always sort of um, my my success for what it was it it, it, it was always um, press led it was it was always it was always one of those things it was always like critical acclaim and which you know I mean uh, you know the um, when when I've been frustrated by dealing with labels and everything because. What in labels promise you the world, and there's a lot of excitement when you make an album. You know that they're really excited, and um, and and, there's a, and they promise all sorts of things. And then when, on the on the release date, when it comes, if it comes out in the, in the first week, if it, if it doesn't go crazy, the you know they they tend to go oh, and and then you can you can you can re, you can you can almost see them wilting where they go. Oh, it didn't do anything on the first day, and. And then they kind of think. Then they kind of move on to something else, and um, and and that's the way it is because you know they would say that you know they want to sell records. And so I start. I started just with the advent of CDs. Uh, you know, it was possible to to record an album yourself and manufacture it yourself on CD. So I used to get. I just used to get small numbers of of albums done. It was really expensive originally. So in '96. I, uh, I just produced 10 CDs of this album called Scouse Pie, I called it. And, um, and what's it, I put it out just before Christmas. And, and what, what we did, we, 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 kind of, we kind of made, you know, um, little, little real pies that we, made in, that we baked in the oven. But they, were, they had mincemeat in them, like, like an immense pie. And they had like Dean Johnson Scouse Pie on the pastry. And the CD was in the middle of it. And I sent it to the enemy and Melody Maker and everything like that. And Q, and with journalists being journalists, they, 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 they cut the pie open and started to eat it, you know, because it was because it was nearly Christmas and they'd been the pub, and then and then they put the CD on, and then come come January nineteen ninety seven, I was uh, I was album of the month in 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 Mojo, what's name uncut, what's name Q, 
Um, I got what's him? I got four stars in Rolling Stone in America, and album of the week in in the Enemy and Melody Maker. Wow! Through through a through, I so I only ate, I we only pressed up ten copies, and then um, and what's name? And then stuck stuck it in a pretend pie, you know, and then and then what's name? And then then everyone, everybody wanted to sign wanted to sign the album then, you know. And because it, it just got, it just got the, the reviews were just like love letters from, you know, from the from the music press, and um, and so I, I got I got a publishing deal, um, with a with a company called Eaton Music, and and they had um they they looked after Ringo's publishing and looked after Leo Sayers publishing, and Harry Nielsen, Harry Nielsen, and they also administered uh, Randy Newman's uh, wow. uh, publishing and Jimmy Webb. And uh, so they, they were, you know, they were real. They were real big hitters in Sloan Square in London, and so, you know, they they gave they put me on a retainer, so I was able I was able to live, you know, as a, and and do what I do and and kind of um, and be paid for it, you know. I didn't have to worry about I didn't have to worry about you know doing like you know doing gigs to make a living anymore. The um the what thing it sent me it took the financial worry of that away. So we were just able to write all the time, and then and I just proceeded to ch churn out, um, you know, album after album that was like that was like critically acclaimed. Uh, each time, you know, the the, the reviews just got better and better, and um, and then and then just invitations to open for you know for the great and the good. I was just for fifteen years. I was I was never I was never off the road. So who did you open for? I I know the bands, but can you tell us a few yeah. anecdotes and a few? Because I saw the Beach Boys, for instance, as an example. Yeah. You know, the, yeah, you know, the, the, I mean, who who have I opened for? You know, who who, who haven't I? You know, the the uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of the, of the, of the big of the biggest ones, the biggest ones for you. You know that, um, you know the, the what's that, you know level level forty two was was a hard Hard tour, um, you know their, their audience were very tough. They were, you know, a lot of a lot of Essex girls with their handbags on the floor and stuff. And um, you know, and I was I was still doing basically the music I, I always do. But but night after night, I kind of you know I kind of worked on them, and I kind of um, you know that when I when I did these support tours, Anthony, what 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 the whole evening was about for me is is that the, the headline band had a great night that the audience were warm when I when they came on. I, I wasn't there, you know, to sort of get my own ego across and things like that. I want I wanted the audience to be in a good mood and I wanted them up by the time the main act came on. And um and what's same and, and and that one that was with the air the um I'm there talking to the and also and it's turned around me and I mean, oh, you're there. Yeah, you've just you've you you staggered a little bit for a few seconds, but you're back. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You just missed about a minute there, um, I think. Yeah. After what, what on the final on the final you know. And they, you know, it's full of two and a half thousand level four maniacs. Sorry, um, which which was this concert? Because we we lost you slightly. Uh, so, you know, along over, you know. Yeah, because some of the great stuff you were talking here about being a support act is really extraordinary because the previous guest on this show is um, Charlie Farron, who's known for being America's great support act. So now I've had the two, the UK's yeah. main support act and Charlie. So going back, because we we start, we lost the signal a little bit there. Can you go back to telling yeah. us about the support act? And you were telling us about, um, was it level 42? and and everything yeah. and, and moving on from there so if you can just go back to that yeah because on some of these tours 
an acoustic singer songwriter. Um, what's him? The, the you know, when you kind of you're kind of in a win win situation with as a support because you get to play your venues, and play, not do your part of the evening, but you're just, but you're just a, like a special guest. Or, um, but I always had a, an ethos where I just wanted to make the evening as great as it could be. I want I wanted the audience to be really ready for the for the opening act to come on, and I, I wanted to I just keep bigging them up during my set, and then and then it cuts both ways that you know that the main act will watch you on their monitor in their dressing room and they see that you you're giving it your best shot, and and also you, you know you got a lot of respect for the main band, and so uh, marking he took to coming on and introducing me of a night, then then once he's done that. They they kind of dare throw things at you because you know he's endorsed you. You know I'm a, they think you're a friend of Mark King, and a, and a, it was one of the most lovely things ever at the at the last gig, the Hammersmith Odeon, which is a massive place, and um and it's it's very very London. You know it's got very London vibe. Um, I was halfway through my set and the, and the audience started applauding, you know, wildly and everything and whooping and everything. And I, I thought, what have I done? You know, what have I done to deserve that? But but I turned around and, and Mark King was walking towards me with this with a, a huge bouquet of flowers, which he presented me with. And then he put his arm around me and he, he went to the microphone and he said, the, the, the greatest opening act we, we've ever, ever had. They were saying, I, you know, I love this guy and I know you do too. And then Dean Johnson, you know, and, uh, and what's saying, and of course, you know, they, they were to his, you know, his agents at the side of the stage and everything, and they're clocking all this, you know, and they're, and you know, and they're they're keeping you, they're keeping you in mind for the next for the next big thing, and um, there was a there was a there was a show a, a show I did in Liverpool, um, there used to be a, there used to be an event called the Summer Pops, mm-hmm. which where they where they put a great big tent down at the pier head, and um, so an an agent phones me and says Brian Ferry. Is performing tonight, but he's got laryngitis, and what he doesn't know how long his voice will last. So, will you will you open for him? But instead of your usual twenty five minutes, will you do an hour? Because what time this concert has to lo- has, has to last two hours, at least two hours, or Brian Ferry doesn't get paid. The what time the promoter can refuse payment. So we said the, the Brian Ferry concert plus special guest has got to last over two hours, but he reckons Brian doesn't know how long he'll be able to do. So what's him? So I do my bit, and then they say to me that Brian Brian's going to do what he can, and then when his voice goes, you need to step on and do the rest of the night with his band. And um, so what's him? So Brian. You know, ferry get ferry gets through about about forty minutes, but the, but but the music has got has got to last like another another half an hour longer than that, and um so I, I you know I get up in Liverpool, you know in in front of two and a half thousand people, you know Brian Ferry has to get off and they've just got this guy from the Wirral, and then I and then I ju- I just did I just did rock and roll covers with Brian Ferry's band. For thirty-five minutes, and the and the audience went crazy, and um, and what same? And then I came off, and I got this, the you know the, the strongest of bear hugs ever from Brian Ferry, who just said, you know, you just saved my life, you know. Wow. And, uh, and what same? And then and then whenever he tours now, you know, we always get, you know, whenever he comes near the northwest, then you know I always get backstage passes and stuff, and I'm always, you know. You know, have a chin wag with him after after the gig, you know, and um, but it was um, it was such a bottle test, you know. I mean, thinking about it, you know, it's one of those situations where I don't know how I did it, but I did. And um, at also at the summer pops, the um, the um, Ray Charles played, and um, it was a really a really really windy windy night, and um, as as he start as he started his performance. 
they 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 have the speakers what they call it they were flying they fly the speakers which means they put up they put them up in the air above the stage and they'd flown these speakers but they were rocking like mad and um the promoter was worried that if one of them was going to come down and, and hit ray charles so they wanted they, they wanted the, those speakers bringing down onto the ground so so ray, ray charles was going to leave the stage because they couldn't do it while he was singing and so they asked me would i would i go and fill in while ray charles goes backstage and they bring these speakers down so so i, I did that for i did that for 20 minutes and then then ray, ray charles ray charles it came came back on and uh and what's name and, and took it took me by the arm you know and and sort of made me take a bow in front of the audience and um and, and he just said this guy this this guy has got far too much balls for a white guy you know that is just extraordinary i mean i i it must have been just like you wanted you know kill me now you know this, yeah. this is, well this is we, what's it you know i, I took the, my longest gig with touring wise was was with the christians the little mm -hmm. band the christians i I, I taught. I opened for them. Um, well, them and Carrick, them and Carrick. I did. Um, I did five years with the Christians. You know, opening every tour for five years. They, you know, they, the audience just knew knew it was me. And um, and what's it? And, and we 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 did a show in Aberdeen. And um, and what's it? And it, it, I was going on first. Then then it was the Christians. Um, and it was it was it was like a big festival. We we were close we were clo closing the, the festival, and then it was like it was me, the Christian, then James Brown, and um, and what time? And it it's uh, you know I, I remember on the day thinking, oh, I hope we get to meet James Brown. But the yeah. the, the people on the crew said James Brown he doesn't arrive until the band are on stage, and um, you know because they do this thing where they get people to chant. You know, James Brown, James Brown. And it, they work the audience up for half an hour and then he comes on. And um, and so, you know, so it comes to 7.30 and I'm on first. And it's an outdoor, an outdoor festival in um in what's his name, in Aberdeen. And then um I'm giving it my best shot and all that. And I, I used to in the middle of my set, I I used to do um long train coming, the the doobie, doobie song. Doobie Brothers classic. <laughs> Absolutely love so that song. I always did that because it was a way for me to get them to clap their hands. And I, you know, I do a few of my own songs and then to reward them, I do the doobies and then, you know, and then what's same, and then I do a couple more of my own and then I, and then I would finish with Higher Ground by Stevie Wonder. And um, so anyway, I, I finished this long train coming and I really, they really got into it. And um, they were saying, and they really, I got them to get, I got them to be like the drums for me kind of thing. And, uh, and it really, and it really, really worked. And then, and then again, these big screams go up, and the next thing that someone's got their arm around me, <laughs> and, and I look, I look over my shoulder, and it's James Brown, and what's name, and he he's come on the stage, and what's name, and and then he he's just saying, he just said, you know, how how people, how great was that, a, a guy on his own, a guy on his own, give it up, give it up for this kid, give it up, and. Um, so I finished and I, and I went off and he, and he was standing there. I said, that was fantastic, kid. I loved it. And I said, you know, I wish I'd known you were coming because, you know, they, they, what's name, they always say you, you, ne you never arrive until your band are on. And he goes, this is the, he said, it's the first time in 62 years I've ever turned up and seen the opening act. <laughs> wow. So you could say mama has got a brand new bag. Yeah. Certainly take it to the bridge, man. Take it yeah, to the bridge. Yeah. Because, I mean, again, just extraordinary, you know, the James Brown, you know, and I was, yeah. I never realised because the chanting of the James Brown, I was immediately, was it, was it Tom Tom Club did a song where they actually had, yeah. you know, the, the, the talking head schism group. Yeah, yeah. And they had a song where they, they, ran, they said James Brown, James Brown over and over again. But really, there's a wonderful link here because... Um, in terms of, of music, for instance, I know we were talking before we started about both our love of the Doobie Brothers. And you were talking yeah. about when you backed, when you, you supported the Doobie Brothers yeah. and that the incident with Patrick Simmons, if you can. Yeah. The, the one thing, because that was a, that was a really spooky gig. That It was really, it was scary because um, it was one of them where um, they, their support, they brought support with them from America, but, 
but he got um, a sore throat and, and couldn't do that night. It was, what's his name? I think it, it, it was, um, St- it was Stephen Bishop was meant to be doing it. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. And what's that? And he was doing, he was doing the rest of the tour. So it was one of, I was phoned by an agent said, if you can get down to the Hammersmith, then uh, you can do it. And um, so I got there and, and, the, and the doobies were sound checking and everything. And, um, and what's name? And so the I as a supporter, I didn't I didn't get a, a, a sound check really. I got I got a thing called a line a line check, which is just to make sure your microphone is live and your guitar is live. You know, you don't get a chance to do a song or anything. And um, because the crew, when they've done the sound check for the main band, they want to go and have something to eat and a lie down and everything. And um, so I get I do a line check and the one of the one of the uh, advents of sound engineering that, that had come along in the last 30 years, Anthony, is is in in ear amplification. You know, where they a lot of the bands were an in inner ear uh, full back. You know, when you go on stage in a big place like the Hammersmith, you have these little speakers in front of you. They're called they're, they're called full back, where you can hear yourself. Nice. And um, so anyway, the I get on and do my line check, and the, there's no fold back at all. And I, I say to the sound guy, Where, "Where's when? When are you going to put the fold back there?" And he goes, "We're not. The doobies don't use it. They use inner ear." And um, and I said, "Yeah, but I I, I don't. I you know I haven't got one." And they said, "You're just going to have to do what you can, man." But they didn't use it. so so I couldn't hear myself at all. Mm. Well, well, I could hear myself. I could hear I could hear the ricochet of me off off the back wall. Wow. So when I, when I when I went on, if I went on and went good 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 evening, good evening Anthony at the Hammersmith Odeon, you know, I didn't hear that. I just went good evening Anthony, nothing, and then maybe 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 seven seconds later, it just went good evening Anthony off the back wall, coming back at me. Wow. And um, and it was it was it was sold out, and there, there were thousands of people there, and um. So, so during the first song, I had to I had to find out I had to find out where the beat was. I had to find out where this ricochet was. So if I went dun dun, and then I had to wait for it to come dun dun back at me, and I, I had to calculate the beat, the distance of the beat coming back to me to find out where in time was. God, that must have been stressful. That uh, you know, that is the things you don't appreciate of musicians, isn't yeah. it? And it and it and it was it was it was it was you know I was so I was so fr- you know scared of, of sound and rubbish and everything. And, and the Hammersmith uh, Odeon is such a vast yeah. place. I mean, I've yeah. seen you know I saw the Little River Band there and bands like that yeah. years ago. You know, and you realise how difficult balancing that must be. But to support the Doobies, did they have the yeah. t- twin drummers? Did they have the double drummers? Yeah. As well, they 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 come back together. For the it was their it was their re, reunion tour. Yeah, they did an uh, album called Wheels, didn't they? Year yeah. after, which yeah. was really good. You know, because I really like the original. The, remember the first Doobie Brothers album, the really raw one, where yeah. it's just the acoustic music and their yeah. bikers. That was That's a cool. brilliant album. But I loved I loved when they got bigger and they had the twin drummers and Hossack yeah. and, and and other people. And yeah, they he, really he was, had this he was there. It was was yeah. he? Yeah, wow. and what's name? And what's name? Came, what's name came back for the first time for thirty years? I mean, what, uh, Tom Johnston. Tom Johnston. I was going to say Tom yeah. Johnston because because he was the main man for the time. He was the voice, yeah. wasn't he? Really? And yeah, him they, and Pat they, they did. They did. They they did about seventy percent of, of excuse me of that first album. Oh that, that wow! First record, that the Doobie story. Brothers, and um, because of course that um, you know. Because when when Michael McDonald joined, they became a different band. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I quite like the Blue Eyed Soul yeah. bit, and I yeah. love Michael McDonald's voice when he was singing background with Steely Dan yeah. and things. Yeah. But to me, I like the Rora Biker, yeah. which is what they've gone back to now, or yeah, they, yeah. They, they they did that, you know. But the Soul idea, I mean, Living on the Fault Line was a great album. Taking it to the streets, brilliant yeah. as well. But it, I always felt there were two different bands, as you said. Yeah, and I like yeah. them both for different reasons. Um, what's saying before you you you're right there because what's saying living on the fault line was so brilliant because it was there was still there was still 
facets of both sides. Yeah. That was before they became, before, you know, before what a fool believes and minute by minute, before mm. they become just a sort of blue eyed soul thing, there was still that rootsy, um, you know, American, American, like sort of freewheeling sound about them, wasn't there, you know? Yeah, I mean, but, to uh, me, I mean, when I first heard What Were Once Vices and Now Habits, that blew my mind. I have to say as an album on headphones, you know, yeah, just yeah. the way yeah. the rhythms worked. And at that time, you know, there was the three big bands, wasn't there? There was Steely Dan, there was the Doobie Brothers and the Eagles. And they were like a kind of a, a spectrum yeah. of music that we all loved that influenced so many of yeah. us. And, you know, Jackson Brown was involved in the background to the Eagles and everything else as well. Yeah. Wonderful period of music. But tell us the story of, of when you finished the gig as well. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. What's like, well, you know, it was one of those gigs when you know when it when I finished it, you know, you you know you feel that you know you feel as if you've sort of you know, well you know walked through fire or something, you know, and um, you know I, I was so I was so relieved to get through it, and it went and it was received it was received so well, so I was really pleased with myself because like yourself because I was a massive Doobies fan, and then um, and what's saying so they they went on everything and I I was hanging around backstage, and then. Um, and I'm just I'm on my way out through the back door that that evening. There was just a there, were, there was just like coming towards me. There was just like the longest the longest black car I'd ever I'd ever ever seen. You know the the front of it passed me, but it seemed to take a couple of minutes for the front of it to pass me. And then it and then it stopped. And then and then, and this this door silently flew open. And um and and it's like this like this skinny a skinny little hand like beckoned me in. And I, and I looked and I looked in and it was Pat Simmons and he and he goes man get in get in and um and he goes what's the name and, I, and I, you know he, he clutched my wrist and he said I just wanted to thank you for tonight and he said it's it's Dean isn't it I said yeah and he said whoa and and he and he said how long have we been doing this I don't know I don't know, forty years or something and um and he said that we've had, we've had so many people open for us. But I've never seen an opening act like you. And he said, and I've never felt the band, I've never felt the audience so warm as when we went on. You, you'd already, he said, you'd already built them. So it's a, it saved us two songs where we usually have to get them like that. They were primed and ready. And he said, and it was just, he said, it just made it perfect. But he said, that, you know, uh, I just want to, I just wanted to say that how much I admire you. And I, I really, really, you're the best we ever had. <laughs> wow. Right. Well, what I think we need to do is um, I want to continue this conversation. I think we've just scratched the surface. I think yeah. our taste in music, I think we could have a fascinating. I do another thing called Incon yeah, yeah. and it's much, much longer and it's much more relaxed. Now, what I think we'll do is we'll finish this for now and we'll have a quick chat afterwards yeah. in terms of how we will do this. But yeah. for now, thanks. Thanks for your time. Um, and it's been absolutely extraordinary. And I just feel I just it's just great to get the snapshots of the background to being um, a musician. And it was wonderful. So everybody, oh, thanks thank for you. listening in. I'm sorry if there's been issues with the bandwidth and everything, but I'm sure we'll 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 we'll, we'll revisit this as well in terms of that. But thanks, everybody, for listening in and um, be speaking again to you all soon. Thank you.